Hello everyone, this is Canon Post with the second episode of our Paschal Tide Catechism. We will call this lesson the Women of the Cross and the Sepulchre. So let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Pour forth upon us, O Lord, the spirit of thy love, that by thy loving kindness thou mayest make to be of one mind those whom thou hast satisfied with the paschal sacraments. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the same Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So hopefully uh, you've all joined me for the first episode, which was about the appearance of Jesus to Our Lady. And now just to explain a little bit further, again, the purpose of this catechism, which I envision uh, particularly for adults, however, young people are, are welcome to, enjoy, uh, to, to join us as well. But it's, it's a catechism, it's a study for adults to grow in knowledge and love of the Catholic faith. So many of us now, uh, most of us find ourselves in a sort of uh, a full lockdown or partial lockdown, and we probably have uh, much more time than usual. So when God gives us the gift of time, we want, to, we want to use it well. We don't want to waste our time or to read or watch a lot of, of rubbish. So let's try to spend this time together to learn more about the faith. I've already learned more in, in the process of of preparing it and studying for this. So let's use the gift of time together and try to enter more into the spirit of Paschal Tide, into the spirit of the Easter liturgy. One, one thing that we encounter frequently, it's often the case with, with devout Catholics, with pious Catholics, that it's easy to enter into Lent with a great uh, zeal. We we take on new practices, uh, new spiritual exercises, resolutions uh, voluntarily. We may um, even take on more fasting or abstinence than the than the church requires now. But um, but we we see this this time of Lent of of penance as a great moment in order to increase the the vivacity of our spiritual lives and. Often it happens that people, at the end, they, they're not sure what to do once they come to Easter. The efforts that they made, um, they, they've gone more or less well. But then I'm at Easter now. I don't have to fast. I don't have to engage in the same kind of abstinence. And um, I maybe don't have the same spiritual exercises that I did during Lent. So what now? So one of our purposes then is to try to respond to that question. St. John Chrysostom in a, in a sermon to the faithful on the night of Holy Saturday, before in the, in the Easter vigil, would say to them that we'll no longer be fasting with the coming of Easter, but we'll be continuing to, to gather the fruits of fasting. So during these 50 days of Paschal Tide, we don't have the same effort to make, but we, we are now gathering the fruits of fasting. So there are enormous uh, graces available to us, and we don't want to lose any of them. We mentioned last time a little bit the, the significance of numbers in the Bible. The number 40 in Lent is always a penitential number. We see our Lord himself would uh, fast for 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. Moses and Elijah would do the same before our Lord. Then we have the 40 years in the desert. The Israelites were invited by God to enter into the promised land, but they refused because they were frightened of the inhabitants. They didn't think, even with God's help, that they would be able to, to take the land. And so they refused God's will. And in punishment, they're forced to wander through the desert for 40 years. So... These 40 days or 40 years are always a sign of, of penance, of ascetic efforts. Also, we might consider that out of the 365 days of the year, 40 makes up a little bit more than 10%, about 11% of the entire year. So when we, when we consider again that in the um, Old Testament and also now the church asks for a certain 
contribution from the faithful materially. Lent is like our spiritual tithe. So that there's a tithe of money, which might be any percent given, in particular 10% in the Old Testament. And these 40 days of Lent of our time given to God is like a, a tithe of our time uh, during the year. On the other hand, Paschal Tide, with its 50 days, made up this perfect number seven times seven with the with the holy day of pentecost uh, capping it off at 50 this number of 50 if we consider it against the entire year makes up about one seventh of the year so we can compare paschal tide to a kind of great sabbath a sabbath rest it's our yearly sabbath and we enter into the Sabbath rest, we enter into the promised land of Easter after our efforts of 40 days during Lent. So with that said, how are we going to go about this study? What are we going to try to draw out of it? Uh, there are two things in particular that I have in mind. Uh, we can study the liturgy a little bit of the church. Um, through her, her prayers uh, at the beginning of this, this session. I said the prayer Spiritum Nobis, which comes from the Mass of, of Easter. Then we can also listen to some of the, the liturgical chant at the beginning and end. I, I will provide uh, some, of the, some of the most beautiful chants of the church, as well as um, some liturgical art or lit, um, art that's inspired by the liturgy. But then in particular, we're going to look together at the Holy Scriptures, at the moments in which our Lord appears to the, the women and the apostles after his resurrection, and try to understand better um, what the Gospels teach us about the risen Lord, what this means for our faith. The, the resurrection will really be at the center of the, the preaching, the message of the apostles in the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament. And so since this is the, the foundation, the foundation of our faith, we really uh, owe it to ourselves to, to spend some time to really study it and, and to be strengthened in our faith by, by meditating on the risen Lord. How then should we go about studying the scriptures? First of all, we always need to pray to ask uh, the grace of the Holy Ghost in order to be able to understand these holy books. They're not like any other book. And we also believe that uh, even though they, the various books of the Bible each have a human author, ultimately the author of the entire Bible is, is God himself, is the Holy Ghost. So if we want to understand it, we need to enter into the mind of God. We need uh, to pray to the Holy Ghost to receive his inspiration. Then we're going to read carefully and slowly. We're going to compare the four Gospels with one another. Also, we can check the references in a good Bible. There will always be references given for the Old Testament, especially for uh, quotes that come from the Old Testament. So we want to go back and see what is it that the New Testament authors are, are quoting to us and what is the significance. And then if we're stuck, if we don't understand uh, the scriptures, we want to find a good commentary, so uh, we don't need to make it up for ourselves. As Catholics, we're part of a 2,000-year uh, living tradition, and we have the Fathers of the Church to help us out, who are much smarter than we are, and, and very holy people who, who teach us uh, the Catholic faith. And you might not have time to go searching through all the Fathers yourself, but very, very luckily for all of us, St. Thomas Aquinas has done the work for us. So if you're not familiar with this, this is what's called the Catena Aurea. So what it is is St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, who was um, very, very knowledgeable in all of the writings of the fathers, went through, gathered them together, and made a running commentary on the Gospels with all of the with selected portions of the fathers on each Gospel. So you can, any for any passage in the Gospels, you can go, you can look up with St. Thomas Aquinas what, what the fathers have said about it. Uh, I have a four-volume version here 
I very highly recommend it. Get one for your library. And if you don't have the money, uh, ask St. Joseph for help. And I'm sure you will be able to find the resources for this book. It should really be in, in everyone's library. It's, it's a really a treasure trove of the teachings of the fathers of the church. Of course, we want to we want to know our catechism and and always to read the scriptures with the mind of the church uh, through our Catholic faith, and not to not to go off in strange directions on our own. Now, with that said, today we're going to take a particular look at Saint Matthew's account of the first of all the burial of our Lord and then the resurrection. Uh, we'll look at St. John's account in particular, maybe next time. I would encourage you on your own to read St. Mark and St. Luke. Each of the Gospels gives us a bit of a different perspective, and we want to put them all together. But I'll do a little bit of the work for you uh, with a, a chart that I've made. I'll, I'll provide a link to it. But in the meantime, uh, we will look at particular at, uh, we'll look in particular at St. Matthew's Gospel, and then we're going to study in particular the, the women who are present at the cross and at the sepulchre, and what we can learn uh, from them. So, going now to St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, we go to verse 55, and it says, and there were there many women afar off who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among whom was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. And when it was evening, there came a certain rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded that the body should be delivered. And Joseph, taking the body, wrapped it up in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new monument, which he had hewed out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the monument and went his way. And there was there Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulchre. And the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we have remembered that that seducer said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, the sepulchre to be guarded until the third day, lest perhaps his disciples come and steal him away, and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, and the last heir shall be worse than the first. Pilate saith to them, You have a guard, go guard it as you know. And they departing made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting guards. It's the end of chapter 27. In chapter 28, we'll see uh, the resurrection of our Lord. Just to pause for one moment to make a little um, observation, and we'll see this at the beginning of chapter 28. The, the Jewish day, of course, was not reckoned the same way that we uh, consider time. If you go back to the book of Genesis for each day, it will say at the end, it was, and it was evening and morning the first day or the second day. And so... For the Jews, the day began in the evening and ended uh, the following evening. So the Sabbath, for example, begins on Friday evening and ends on Saturday evening. And as with so many other things in the church, this uh, um, remained part of the living tradition of, of the Catholic Church and of the Catholic liturgy. Up until the reforms, the liturgical reforms of the 1950s and 60s, all of the feasts of the church began with what is called First Vespers. So if you have, for example, the feast of St. Thomas Aquinas on 7th of March, it's not on the 7th of March that the feast begins, but on the evening of March 6th with First Vespers, which goes until uh, March 7th, you have Second Vespers in the evening. So we see uh, part of the Jewish roots of the Catholic liturgy here, of the way that uh, liturgical time is, is considered, is reckoned. So our Lord is, of course, crucified on Friday afternoon. He dies, we believe, around three o'clock. And the Sabbath is coming. The, 
the Pharisees want the bodies to be taken down rapidly so that um, the, the Sabbath will be observed. And so the, the holy women, Joseph of Arimathea, are forced to do, um, do this rapidly to also to make the, um, the, the burial rites to anoint the body in a very rapid way. And the women are going to look after the Sabbath to come back and to finish what they were unable to do on Friday, Friday evening. So another thing to consider here, very interesting, is St. Matthew's Gospel is the most Jewish of the Gospels, and he's going to, to bring to light really almost everything that is, is, is negative, uh, as, you can, as you can find, about the Pharisees. Um, it's a, the judgment is very, very harsh against the Pharisees. But one thing that I think um, should not be lost in this, uh, one of the sisters, in fact, mentioned it to me, which is the on the Sabbath day, the Pharisees will have um, this um, concern to make sure that the tomb is guarded. So they are, throughout the Gospels, extremely scrupulous about keeping the Sabbath. But on the other hand, here we'll see that they go out of their way to make sure that the, the tomb is, is guarded, even if that's on the Sabbath. On the other hand, we see that the holy women will keep the Sabbath uh, by resting, by uh, finishing the preparations before the onset of, of night, and that they will not set out again until after the Sabbath is over. And also, of course, there's a there's a spiritual or mystical meaning uh, in this. The things in the Old Testament always um, prefigure things that will come in the New Testament. So the Sabbath day itself, uh, the seventh day of creation, prefigures things to come. And in the Holy Week, in which uh, man is recreated through the work of Jesus Christ, so we have the, the seven days of creation, and then we have Holy Week, uh, which is a kind of recreation, just as God will rest on the seventh day from all of his work. So Jesus Christ on Holy Saturday will rest from the work of salvation. He's accomplished all there is to do, though his, the work is very good. And so he will spend uh, the Sabbath in the tomb in a site kind of perfect rest. Um, and so Jesus uh, who is accused again by the Pharisees of being a Sabbath breaker, will uh, show himself to be, in fact, the, the Lord of the Sabbath and he who keeps it most perfectly. So with that said, let's go on and read uh, chapter 28, the beginning, and see what, what happens to the women who go to the tomb. And in the end of the Sabbath, when it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and coming rolled back the stone and sat upon it. And his countenance was as lightning and his raiment as snow. And for fear of him, the gods were struck with terror and became as dead men. And the angel answering said to the women, Fear not you, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord was laid. And going quickly, tell ye his disciples that he is risen. And behold, he will go before you into Galilee. There you shall see him. Lo, I have foretold it to you. And they went out quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, running to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. But they came up and took hold of his feet and adored him. Then Jesus said to them, Fear not, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee. There they shall see me. So, end of quotation from the scriptures. Now, what I would like to do is take a look a little bit at the all of the women that we encounter to better understand these characters and what they teach us. I've made a little chart, um, which I will bring up on the screen for you, hopefully which shows us uh, which women were where. So we have our four Gospels along the top, and we see who was at the cross and who was at the sepulchre. Now, first of all, uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary is mentioned only in St. John's Gospel. We talked about her role a little bit last time and also in our series on the Seven Sorrows. 
Then we see uh, Mary Magdalene, according to all four Gospels, is uh, present both at the cross and at the sepulchre. St. Luke uh, would not mention any women by name at the cross, but elsewhere we see uh, Mary Magdalene's name is a constant. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about her now. Um, I plan to, to go into more depth about St. Mary Magdalene in our next lesson. Then what's interesting is that we come to Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, according to St. Matthew. St. Mark makes it um, clear that this is James the Less. So you have the two apostles, James the Great, James the Less, the mother of James the Less and Joseph. And in St. John's Gospel, we have Mary, the sister of the Blessed Virgin and the wife of Cleophas, which would appear to be the same Mary as the mother of James and Joseph. Now, um, I'm not going to explain it all on my own now. I always think it's not, uh, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. So. One of the things I've been spending a lot of time looking at lately is the work of a man named Dr. Brent Petrie, who's a Catholic biblical scholar. His, his work is excellent. He has a, um, a website and a YouTube channel called Catholic Productions. And using in part this these passages from the Gospels, he looks at the identity of this Mary, because elsewhere in Matthew's Gospel, we, we see that James and Joseph are identified as brothers of Jesus. And this is what has led to uh, many Protestants um, claiming that Mary and Joseph had children other than Jesus. And then often agnostics uh, like to claim this as well to, to mock the idea of uh, the Virgin Mary. So perhaps you've heard this, perhaps you've been confronted by this claim before and you, haven't, uh, you didn't know what to say. So what I'm going to do is direct you, in fact, to um, to a to a movie by to a video by uh, Dr. Brent Petrie, which looks at this uh, claim, which is excellent. Also, um, if you're interested, you can look at uh, work by Saint Jerome called Against Helvidius. Helvidius was a heretic in the fourth century that uh, made the same claim that that Our Lady had other children other than Jesus, and Saint Jerome, in his usual rather brutal fashion will take apart this claim. So I would like to just um, to point you on to these resources. I don't need to uh, explain it all again on my own, but please go in and check it out. Um, and um, I recommend again, everything by Dr. Brent Petrie and Catholic Productions are really, really absolutely excellent. I'm not on the, the payroll, but uh, I myself uh, have become quite fascinated with this work. And I think you will too, if you, if you check it out. So uh, take a look at the link there and you can learn about Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, identified as the sister of the Blessed Virgin Mary and James and Joseph being the, the children of this Mary, who's not, uh, not Our Lady, but the sister of Our Lady. These, um, these men were, are therefore not brothers uh, directly of Our Lord, but cousins. Then moving along, we see another woman present in St. Matthew's Gospel, the mother of the sons of Zebedee. And then in St. Mark's Gospel, Salome, okay? Now, what's interesting, of course, who, who are the sons of Zebedee? Who is Zebedee? We see Zebedee in the Gospel, the beginning and the call of the apostles. Zebedee is the father of James the Greater and the Apostle John. So St. Matthew mentions the mother of the sons of Zebedee. St. Mark uh, mentions her by name, Salome almost like uh, certainly the same the same woman. But St. John is not going to mention her, perhaps because um, she's his own mother. So he doesn't, uh, he wants to maybe um, depersonalize his account a little bit. But why is this interesting to consider that St. John's own mother was at the cross according to St. Matthew and St. Mark? Well, if we think about the the final words of our Lord on the cross, when he 
gives Our Lady to St. John and gives St. John to Our Lady. He says, behold your mother, behold your son. So he says to John the Apostle, behold your mother, speaking of Our Lady, yet his very mother is there, the mother of the sons of Zebedee. John's mother is there, but Jesus says to him, behold your mother, speaking not of of his his mother Salome, but of the Blessed Virgin. So the really the context that his mother, his true mother is there, makes uh, our Lord's words to John that much stronger. Something to consider uh, again about the the place that Our Lady holds in John's Gospel. Now, with that said, uh, we see again Saint Luke doesn't mention any women in particular, but a great crowd of women. Also, St. Luke um, points out that the, the women um, follow our Lord on the way of the cross. It's one of the stations of the cross. St. Mark also says many other women. So we, we, have, um, we have these three or four women mentioned in particular, but there are other present. Then at the sepulcher, all four gospels, all four evangelists are going to mention St. Mary Magdalene. And then the other Mary, according to St. Matthew, that's almost certainly um, Mary, the sister, uh, the, the woman identified as the sister of the Blessed Virgin. Although, again, she, by sister may also be meant a cousin. So it's not necessarily the, the sister, but possibly even the cousin of the Blessed Virgin. Then we have, yes, who is also identified as the mother of Joseph or uh, Mary of James by the other evangelists. Salome, who we said is the name of the mother of the sons of Zebedee. And then St. Luke mentions one other woman, Joanna. And if we do a search in the Gospels, I always think it's, um, if you see something in the, the Gospels you don't know much about, a, a very good thing to do is you go on, you go online, you find uh, a good Catholic Bible, the Dewey Reams, for example, you do a, a search for the name of the person. Where else does this person happen to be in the Bible? So I did that for Joanna, and we find her in St. Luke chapter 8, verse 2 and, and 3. It says, And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, who is called Magdalene, out of whom seven devils were gone forth, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who ministered unto him of their substance. So this is the, the, the women of Galilee who follow our Lord. Um, we don't know anything else about Joanna, but um, St. Luke perhaps knew her um, particularly well, and so he mentions her, whereas the other evangelists don't. So with that said, uh, we, we see some interesting things here. We learn more about uh, Mary, the, the mother of James and Joseph, we have here um, what I think is definitive proof from the Bible itself that uh, the so-called brothers of our Lord are, are in fact cousins. And so it's important to be able to look closely at the details, to look at the different Gospels. And, and this enables us to, to respond to many of the false claims that are sometimes made by, by other people, by different sects. And we want to fulfill what's said by, by St. Peter in, in his first epistle. Sanctify the Lord Christ in your hearts, being ready always to satisfy everyone that asketh you a reason that, for that hope that is in you. Okay. And then likewise, Jude in his epistle will say, Dearly beloved, taking all care to write unto you concerning your common salvation, I was under a necessity to write unto you, to beseech you, to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. So knowing these things, uh, knowing um, how strong the words of our Lord are to St. John, for example, when John's real mother is there, but he says, Our Lady is your mother, we, we can have a bit of a response to, to Protestantism when, when Protestants downgrade the role of Our Lady. So now we've seen all of the women mentioned by name in the Gospels. We see that the women are uh, there at the cross. Only John um, of all of the apostles is going to make it back to the cross. All of the other apostles have fled, but the women are there at the cross. The women are also the first witnesses of the resurrection and thus of the faith in our risen Lord. 
uh, in the ancient world, men were considered more reliable witnesses than women. So the gospel writers, we can, we can presume, would not have, have put this forward unless it were true. Okay? If you're going to fabricate a story about the resurrection of, of a man, you would not place um, in the ancient world women in the forefront as your witnesses because it would make, uh, it would make the account seem less reliable to most audiences. So uh, the fact that the evangelists don't shy away from this, again, is a sort of indirect proof of the veracity of the Gospels. We can see the fact uh, that the women were not necessarily considered reliable by the, by the Gospels themselves, by the reaction of the Apostles. St. Mark's Gospel says, uh, chapter 16, verse 9, But he rising early the first day of the week, that is, Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. She went and told them that had been with him, who were mourning and weeping. And they, hearing that he was alive and had been seen by her, did not believe. Okay. Next quotation we have from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. And it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary of James and the other women that were with them who told these things to the apostles. And these words seemed to them as idle tales, and they did not believe them. Thanks. So the apostles themselves are, are not going to believe to begin with. And also, this brings out another thing that we see in the Gospels, which is also another kind of indirect proof for the veracity, which is that the sacred writers frequently uh, bring forth the, the episodes in their lives, in their, their time with Jesus, which are, are quite embarrassing, the, the episodes which are not at all flattering to the character of the apostles. So, for example, they quarrel over who is the greatest among them. Uh, they never seem to understand what Jesus is saying. Speaking of the sons of Zebedee, we see um, this woman again, uh, Salome, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, will, will go to Jesus to ask for the right and left, left hand places uh, for her sons. So if you're writing a gospel, it would seem to be uh, not very flattering to yourself to show uh, that you had your mother go to, to the Lord to do this. We see uh, that they all flee from the Garden of Gethsemane. One even flees naked, according to St. Mark's Gospel. So again, uh, very embarrassing details to um, recount about oneself. Peter attempts to follow later, but will deny uh, our Lord three times. And it's only John that returns to the foot of the cross. But it is the women that show the most love and fidelity and courage uh, towards our Savior and will stay until the very end. So, yes, for it shows the humility again of the apostles too, that they um, put forth the courage of of the holy women while showing forth their own lack of courage. It's the women that go to the tomb. The apostles are ready to go back to work on Monday, so it seems, after the, after the crucifixion. So to those who would claim that the church is misogynist because sin and death came through Eve, here we see that the gospel of resurrection life is first entrusted by Jesus to the women. Again, the, the church fathers also are frequently accused of being uh, know-nothing misogynists. And if you look at uh, what they say about the Annunciation, what they say about the resurrection, the role of women in bringing, um, bringing salvation into the world, Our Lady who says yes to the Archangel Gabriel, and then the women who bring the gospel of salvation, of, of the resurrection to the apostles, that this undoes um, the disobedience of Eve, is the glory of, of the female sex. This uh, counterbalances the things that they seem to say that are very severe about Eve. So yes, they say a lot of things that seem very nasty about Eve, but they're counterbalanced by, by what is said about the Blessed Virgin and about Mary, St. Mary Magdalene and the other holy women. So that's something always to keep in mind when you encounter this, um, this attack on the church and how, um, how the church blames original sin on women. Well, at this, to a certain extent, yes, but on the other hand, uh, the church um, praises women for being instrumental in, uh, in salvation and redemption from original sin. 
certainly these things must have fixed within the apostles the virtue of humility in order to bear effectively God's message. The extraordinary height and power of their vocation was balanced by an intimate knowledge of their own weakness. So in God's providence, uh, certainly this was all prepared to make them more effective apostles later on. St. Paul, who had been humbled by the fact that he was formerly a vicious persecutor of the church, writes the following to the Corinthians. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For see your vocation, brethren, that there are not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but the foolish things of the world hath God chosen, that he may confound the wise, and the weak things of the world hath God chosen, that he may confound the strong. And the base things of the world and the things that are contemptible hath God chosen, and things that are not, that he might bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his sight. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and justice and sanctification and redemption, that, as it is written, he that glorieth may glory in the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.